It's a delight to welcome each and every one of you to the 2006 Cheney Lecture of the Berkeley Divinity School at Yale. The Cheney Lectureship is named for Francis Cheney, who was for many years a professor of pastoral theology here at Berkeley Divinity School. And in recognition of and in thanksgiving for Francis's quietly compelling ministry, his students and friends joined to establish the Francis X. Cheney Lectureship in Pastoral Theology. The lectureship is open by invitation to scholars in all disciplines who seek to bring their expertise to bear on the subject of pastoral theology. In this way, Francis's students and friends ensured the continuance at Berkeley Yale of Francis's own ministry which was to endeavor to transcend doctrinal and vocational differences and so to address the central concern of the minister as a member of the Christian community, that is, the care of the whole people of God. We welcome as this year's uh, lecturer, Regina Schwartz, who is a professor of religion and literature at Northwestern University. She holds her PhD from the University of Virginia, which as you all know is roughly modeled on the Sterling Divinity Quadrangle. <laughs> she is the author of The Curse of Cain, The Violent Legacy of Monotheism, which calls attention to the cultural misuses of scripture to endorse violence. She's authored a book on John Milton's Theodicy and Poetics, Remembering and Repeating, which was the winner of the Milton Society of America's James Holly Hanford's Book Award. And she edited with Valerie Venucci, Desire in the Renaissance, essays that focus on the inner life in English and Italian literature. Her forthcoming book, entitled When God Left the World, Sacramentality at the Dawn of Secularism, explores the ways the sacramental vision infuses the, infuses the poetry, drama, and the wider culture of the Reformation. She edited the collection, The Book and the Text, The Bible and Literary Theory, and co-edited The Postmodern Bible, published by Yale University Press, which helped to broaden biblical studies to literary approaches. Most recently, she edited a volume, Transcendence, colon, Philosophy, Literature, and Theology, Approach the Beyond, on the place of transcendence in philosophy from Kant to Levinas in literature and including Shakespeare and Kafka and in theology ranging from negative theology to sacramentalism. And just on a personal note, I might add that I first got to know Regina when Carla and I were living at the University of Colorado where Carla was an undergraduate and Regina was a newly minted junior professor of English literature and taught Carla uh, uh, John Milton in one of her undergraduate classes there. And since then, she has popped up in our lives at many important turning points. And it's a delight to welcome her here today to share in the Cheney Lectureship. Regina. Thank you so much, Joe, and it's, it's such a pleasure to be here um, at this great institution and on this uh, important occasion. Um, I call this talk Toward a Sacramental Poetics, and I'll begin with uh, just a very brief autobiographical narrative. It was uh, a cold, wet Sunday uh, when I was alone in London when I decided to stop feeling sorry for myself by going to services at St. Giles at Cripplegate, the church that John Milton attended in the 17th century, and also his burial place. I thought that there I could commune with the soul of the poet who's engaged so much of my imaginative life, because I'd been teaching Milton for over 20 years. There I encountered another communion, another communion. After a very inspiring sermon, the priest invited everyone 
to uh, forge the mystical body of God together by, partici by partaking of the body and blood of Christ, to accept the invitation that Christ himself offered at the Last Supper to take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And suddenly, the, the wonderful feeling of warmth that I had in that community uh, chilled with the awareness that I couldn't join. But why not, I asked myself. No one here would prevent me. That is, no one here at St. Giles of Cripplegate knows that I'm Jewish. And as far as my faith is concerned, I thought, well, I don't have to bother myself too much. I could think like a professor and adopt a kind of anthropological pose and take the communion uh, as a scholar of ritual. So instead of staying behind in my pew feeling awkward and embarrassed, and, and you've probably noticed that uh, the Jewish people at masses usually sit there feeling, or leave feeling awkward and embarrassed, uh, while everyone files past me to the altar, I resolved that this time I was going to join the movement forward. So I said to myself, okay, now stand and walk. And an interesting thing happened to me that's never happened before or since, and that is I couldn't move. Um, I just didn't respond to this command. Frozen there, I then reassured myself that I was neither a sinner, nor had I suddenly converted, but someone who just wanted to join. And I was loath to interrupt the spiritual communion that I felt by failing to complete that last ritual gesture with that community. So I tried again, and again I was unable to move. What had happened? Did my terror that Yahweh would strike me down overcome me? Yes. Did I fear that an anthropological experiment was disrespectful of others' meaningful experience? Indeed. Was I thinking that if I ate of Christ's body, I would become Christian? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, all of these things. But it really took the many years that I worked on a study that I just completed on the Eucharist to achieve clarification of my inability to take communion in London. Toward the end of that study, I was on a pilgrimage uh, to Santiago de Compostela with dear friends, mostly priests. And there I had an opportunity to take communion again, this time in, a, in the small chapel of Ignatius Loyola's in, in his house, in a private mass being said for our group. Then I certainly didn't fear the wrath of an ancient Israelite deity, nor did I have any reason to question my respect for communion or the gravity of my intentions. Indeed, my longing to take communion was so serious that my dear friend, the priest who officiated that day, and I had discussed this at great length. And then when the time came, and he spoke so movingly of Christ's sacrifice, I found myself haunted by the specter of war victims, including my own family who had died in the Shoah and in pogroms. Our day that day had begun with a visit to Guernica, where harrowing visions of human violence cry out not only from museums and memorials, but it feels like it's from the very ground, like the blood of Abel. I couldn't take communion, however much I wanted to, after all, because of the generations in my own past who suffered and died for not taking it. My fascination with communion, nonetheless, continued unabated. I was struck by the way that John Milton inveighed vociferously against transubstantiation in his prose with all the conventional reformist rhetoric of the idolatry and cannibalism of eating and digesting God. But nonetheless, in his great epic, he depicts the entire cosmos as in the very act of ceaselessly transubstantiating. In his theological treatise, De Doctrina Christiana, Milton does not mince words, and words like this will be familiar to those of you who read the polemical discourse of the period against transubstantiation. Milton writes, the papists hold that it is Christ's actual flesh which is eaten by all in the mass, but if this were so, even the most wicked of the communicants, not to say the mice and the worms which often eat the Eucharist, would attain eternal life by virtue of the heavenly bread. Besides, he says, such a corporeal understanding of the Mass brings down Christ's holy body from its supreme exaltation at the right hand of God. It drag, drags it back to earth, though it has suffered every pain and hardship already, 
to a state of humiliation even more wretched and degrading than before, to be broken once more and crushed and ground even by the fangs of brutes. Then, when it has been driven through all the stomach's filthy channels, it shoots it out, one shudders even to mention it, into the latrine. So you see, Milton, Milton doesn't love the doctrine. Um, his his uh, rhetoric is colorful if conventional. And yet, and this is a, a remarkable, Milton gives the communion prominence of place in his epic in Paradise Lost, embracing the sacrament with gusto. For he frames the central meal in the epic that Adam and Raphael partake in the garden, and it takes up five books of the epic, this meal. He frames it as a communion. So down they sat, and to their viand fell, nor seemingly the angel, nor in mist the common gloss of theologians, but with keen dispatch of real hunger and concoctive heat to transubstantiate. Those are his lines. And what is Milton doing calling to mind theologians and real presence, which for him has become real hunger, and transubstantiate, such an overloaded term, for a simple luncheon on the grass? Raphael compares their meal to heaven's high feasts, where, quote, tables are set and piled with angels' food, fruit of delicious vines, the growth of heaven, and the angels eat, drink, and in communion sweet, quaff immortality and joy, echoing Jesus' own words that allude to the heavenly community. I tell you, I'll not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. But the heavenly illusion anticipates, for here Milton is describing the earthly and not the heavenly paradise. And in that earthly paradise, what kind of communion is this? First, polemically, it takes place on a table and not an altar. At least, that is what Milton chooses to call the grassy mound in paradise. Raised of grassy turf their table was. I hope you can tell when Milton's talking. I try to change my voice to make it sound Miltonic. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll, I'll do quotes, but that's kind of a drag. Okay. Raised of grassy turf their table was, and mossy seats had round. And on her ample square from side to side, all autumn piled though spring and autumn danced hand in hand. This is before their seasons were unfallen, so spring and autumn dance hand in hand, not unlike today. Second, the communion is not conferred by a priest in vestments, but shockingly, it is ministered by a naked woman. Meanwhile, at table, Eve ministered naked, and their flowing cups with pleasant liquors crowned. Eve crushes grapes, of all things, and we're cautioned to understand that the bountiful fruits of paradise are really digested by the angel, materially, again, not in mist, he writes, the common gloss of theologians, making the emphasis against spiritualizing the sacrament. There are no words of institution, nor a sermon, but there is instead a conversation whose subject is virtually the nature of transubstantiation. For while they're eating, Raphael expounds Milton's own version of the doctrine, inflected by the rhetorics of Neoplatonism, Vitalism, Monism, and Alchemy. One Almighty is, Raphael's speaking now, from whom all things proceed and up to him return, if not depraved from good, created all such to perfection, one first matter, all, endowed with various forms, various degrees of substance, but more refined, more spiritous and pure, as nearer to him placed, or nearer tending. So from the root springs lighter the green stalk, from thence the leaves more airy. Last, the bright consummate flower spirits odorous breathes, flowers and their fruit, man's nourishment, by gradual scale sublimed, to vital spirits aspire. And then the angel offers a demonstration of this wondrous digestion. He eats and says to Adam, wonder not then what God for you saw good if I refuse not, but convert as you to proper substance. They have a big discussion about how can the angel eat human food. Finally, he explains to Adam 
What this whole process of digestion and sublimation and transformation is really about. It's not exactly about the wafer turning into the body of Christ or the wine turning into the blood of Christ, but it certainly is about man becoming God. But wait, isn't that the heart of the Eucharistic doctrine after all? He adds that the whole universe is engaged in this digestive process, but with an important difference. These changes are not affected by the church. Technically, there is no church in paradise, for the world need not be yet restored. Instead, these changes just happen naturally. Moreover, the process of changing substance does not just characterize this meal in the garden. This eating and sublimating describes Milton's entire cosmology. The whole universe is a giant body engaged in ceaseless transformation, even a kind of transubstantiation, a material, digesting, concocting, assimilating body that perpetually and naturally turns matter into spirit and ultimately into Godhead. As Raphael explains, whatever was created needs to be sustained and fed. Of elements, the grosser feeds the purer, earth the sea, earth and sea feed air. Nor doth the moon no nourishment exhale from her moist continent to higher orbs. The sun that light imparts to all receives from all its elemental recompense in humid exhalations and at even sups with ocean. It's impossible for me to see a sunset without thinking of those lines. You know, when the sun sits on the horizon, the sun at even sups with ocean and the humid exhalations going up from the ocean and the sun giving back its elemental recompense. If in his prose, the Puritan Milton invade against transubstantiation as a cannibalistic doctrine, in Paradise Lost, he has delineated an entire vision of a transubstantiating universe. Given that the Eucharist commemorates the redemption of man by Christ, it is indeed remarkable to place the communion that recalls Christ's death in paradise with the unfallen Adam, even more remarkable in the context of English Reformation controversies. The English reformers had already changed the allusion to sacrifice. The sacrifice was to be remembered and not repeated at communion. The altar had become a table. Calvary was not called to mind and not reenacted. But Milton's Eucharist does not even call it to mind. I'm sorry, Calvary was to be called to mind but not reenacted. But Milton doesn't even call it to mind. The body and blood of Christ are not a bleeding body here, but a breathing body. Indeed, a giant living pulsing universe, one whose breath joins the very breath of angels to become the spirit of God. In his remarkable imaginative feat, Milton has depicted a sinless man in the garden with no need for the redemption signaled by the communion engaged in precisely that, a communion. We are challenged to imagine a wondrous thing, a sinless Eucharist. But then the same poet impels us to contemplate the wonder of a paradise instead of our tragic world. But we must contemplate it from afar. In Milton's paradisal, sinless Eucharist, the emphasis will ultimately fall at the end on longing and on frustration, on hope but not an achieved redemption. For him, the doctrine of real presence will leave one with real hunger. John Donne is more hopeful that we can achieve communion here and now rather than in paradise here and now in common love. Dunn has a similar attachment to the sacrament, even though as Dean of St. Paul's, he dare not endorse the heresy of transubstantiation, even or especially because he's an ex-Catholic. Another Anglican parish priest, George Herbert, concluded his architectural anthology of lyrics, The Temple, with his version of transubstantiation. My point is certainly not that many reformed poets were closeted Catholics. That relation may or may not be argued, nor that the Reformation was top down instead of bottom up. Historians endlessly debate this, nor that we need to reevaluate the religious identity of these and other writers to nuance them more finely. That's undoubtedly a worthy enterprise. 
but I'm too worried about the question of religious identity and the violence that inheres in fencing off religious identities to want to recapitulate identity conflicts about the past. Um, as my mother used to say, you can never have too much of God, but sometimes you can get too much of religion when it gets mired in conflicts. Instead, I see a cultural longing for something that the sacrament satisfies so well that it could not be dispensed with by the English Reformation writers, despite all of their critiques of transubstantiation. It still attracted them, it, and still attracts them despite the symbolic force English reformers gave it. They hungered for the Eucharist. They hungered even for transubstantiation. And perhaps on some level we still do, culturally, because it satisfies in the way that nothing else can. As you well know, the meanings that the Eucharist has accrued are stunning. The means of achieving communal justice and peace, for cleansing human fault, for overcoming death, entering the new sacramental body, the communicant is no longer an exile from God, he can enjoy a share of his divinity. No longer an exile from community, he can help to constitute the body of the church. And no longer an exile from creation, he is joined to it materially. The sacrifice satisfies justice, the participation assures love, the words of institution even overcome the failure of fallen language. In short, paradise is restored. We know how, to so many reformers, this sacrifice of mystery had been instrumentalized, according to English reformers, how it had come to signify the rule of the church instead of the body of God. In fact, the phrase corpus mysticum that had once referred to the host was transferred by the Lateran Council to the church. And the corpus Christi, which had referred to the body of the church, was now used to refer to the host. And how, by the Tudor period, the sacrament had become so entangled with politics that the phrase corpus mysticum was even used in legal discourse to signify the body of the monarch and the nation. That is the original sense of the mystical body of participation in a community governed by consent rather than rules seemed threatened. Nonetheless, the tradition always harbored not only corpus understood as a polity, but also mysticum, the mystery. And the longing for that mystery resurfaces again and again, sustained in part by the rich resources of mystical theology, even as the doctrine winds its way through its contested history. This longing for a mystical participation in God is not lost during the English Reformation any more than the hunger for justice, love, and a world alive and redolent with meaning is lost in modern secularism. If anything, it's strengthened during the relentless advance of scientific rationalism. As Christopher Sutton's Godly Meditations Upon the Most Holy Sacrament of the Lord's Supper, a popular devotional book in the 17th century, maintained, it says, okay, the bread and the wine don't change at their consecration. The sacrament nonetheless confesses the mystery. He writes, we must acknowledge that the dignity of this sacrament is greater than words can ever express yea, than the mind of man is ever able to conceive. That'll become very important to me because as I craft out what I'm calling a sacramental poetics, it will include the notion that it's greater than words can ever express. In early modernity, this longing begins to be transfigured into the cultural life of the poetic arts. While their world was shaken by challenges to the medieval system of sacramentality, 16th and 17th century thinkers who lived at the dawn of modernity responded with inventive solutions for holding fast to the sacred even while the modern sciences challenged its presuppositions. And so, while John Milton takes the Eucharist to the cosmos, John Donne took it to the bedroom. Between their imaginations, communion is stretched to the limits of the universe and contracted to the spaces of greatest intimacy. Dunn's seduction lyrics can allude to communion, even inflecting a conventional flea poem with the imagery of the Eucharist, where, quote, our two bloods mingled be. He writes in The Flea. And again, uh, flea poems are, are really an ancient classical trope that he's playing around with. Thou knowest that this cannot be said, uh, a sin, a shame, or loss of maidenhead, 
Yet this, this flea he's referring to, enjoys before it woo and pampered swells with one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. To stop the woman from crushing the flea, the speaker invokes the Trinity. Oh, stay, three lives in one flea spare. The sacredness of marriage. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is. She squashes it. <laughs> it is a seduction poem, and it's a seduction that's not supposed to work. Okay. Uh, she squashes it, and he responds by turning her act into the passion. Cruel and sudden, hast thou since purpled thy nail in blood of innocence? Accusing her of the sacrilege of three sins in killing three. The poem turns not only on the satiric incongruity of the sacrifice of Christ with swatting a flea. Something serious hovers as a remainder. Physical love gets sanctified, even if comically, for the whole trope in the poem requires the, the leap that love making is like communion. Dunn's investment in the physical body cannot be overestimated. Those of us who are Dunn scholars just usually compare notes about his attachment to physicality. Love making recapitulates the union of God and man achieved in the incarnation, echoed in the Eucharist, and is so redemptive that he even imagines making love beyond the grave. Then, too, when he preaches that in the afterlife, Christ excludes marriage because there's no need of it in heaven, there they need no mutual help, he says, nonetheless, that lovemaking is not expressly ruled out. I quote him. Yet he excludes not our knowing, carnally, or our loving of one another upon former knowledge in this world, in the next. Christ does not say expressly, we shall, Yet neither does he say that we shall not know one another there. Neither can we say we shall not, because we know not how we should. <laughs> Dunn is so naughty. Dunn's attachment to the body is also strong enough for him to suggest that the angels should envy us for having bodies, rather than we them. He writes, man cannot deliberately wish himself an angel, because he should lose by that wish and lack by that glory what we have by having a body. After all, he says, we shall be like the angels in the exalting of the faculties of our souls, but they shall never be like us in our glorified bodies. Indeed, the kingdom of heaven hath not all that it must have to a consummate perfection, he writes, till it have bodies too. God did not think heavenly glory so perfect but that it might receive an addition from creatures and therefore made a world, a material world, a corporeal world, so they would have bodies in the heaven of heavens, the presence chamber of God himself, where the presence of our bodies is expected. In many sermons, he argues for the resurrection of the body with the soul. A man is not saved, a sinner is not redeemed, I am not received into heaven if my body be left out. The soul and the body concurred in the making of a sinner, and the soul and the body must concur in the making of a saint. You see why people came from everywhere to hear him. <laughs> then he vividly envisions the physicality of the resurrection and writes, where be all the splinters of that bone which a shot hath shivered and scattered in the air? Where be all the atoms of that flesh which a corrosive hath eaten away or a consumption hath breathed and exhaled away from our arms and other limbs? In what wrinkle, in what furrow, in what bowel of the earth are all the grains of the ashes of a body burnt a thousand years since? In what corner, in what ventricle of the sea, lies all the jelly of a body drowned in the general flood? What coherence, what sympathy, what dependence maintains any relation, any correspondence between that arm that was lost in Europe and that leg that was lost in Africa or Asia, scores of years between? What an imagination. One implication of this grasp of the material imminent world is that for Dunn, communion 
between body and soul, between man and God, and human lovers may indeed be rare. He dwells on how difficult it is to achieve, how transitory its moments are, how much the lover fails to apprehend his beloved due to his own self-absorption, and how much the would-be lover fails to love another and God due to his worldly preoccupations. Nevertheless, it is achievable in Dunn, in this world and in this time. What is remarkable is that Dunn does not pursue this quasi-mystical project of combining by transcending the material world. Rather, by fully embracing materiality, sexuality, and desire, he makes them the very medium of his transubstantiation, his transvaluation. I'm using the term loosely there. This means that he differs from Milton, for whom communion is an achievement before the world as we know it, a feature of prelapsarian paradise. And from George Herbert, about whom I'll also speak, for whom communion will be achieved beyond this world in an, ap an apocalyptic afterlife. Unlike Milton's work then, Dunn's poetry does not lament the loss of a prelapsarian cosmos in which all ingests all and gives back its alimental recompense, in which the sun sups at even with the ocean, as Milton so exquisitely expresses it. The poetry of Dunn tends not to mourn a lost paradise where to behold the face of God was Adam's height of happiness, because it typically looks for the face of God in the face of the lover. It is this look that yields the all in all. And I'm quoting from his lyric, The Good Morrow. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears, and true plain hearts do in the faces rest. Where can we find two better hemispheres without sharp north, without declining west? Whatever dies was not mixed equally. If our two loves be one, or thou and I love so alike that none do slacken, none can die. In addition to its innuendo of sexual consummation, the poem suggests that full love, fully given, achieves eternal life, a kind of resurrection for the lovers. Dunn preached, and I quote him, God is love and the Holy Ghost is amorous in his metaphors. Everywhere his scriptures abound with the notions of love, of spouse, of husband, of marriage songs, and marriage supper, and marriage bed. And the learned divine knew his precedents in his amorous theological metaphors. He drew them from the biblical Song of Songs through Augustine, from Gregory, from Bernard of Clairvaux, and William of St. Terry, from St. Francis and Bonaventura, from Eckhart and the Rhineland School, from Gerson and Denis the Carthusian, from Nicholas of Cusa and Catherine of Genoa, from John of the Cross, from Teresa of Avila. He called all of them for his sermons and his work. This strain of Christianity, this apophatic theology, exerted much influence on English reformers perhaps because it knew no denominational exclusions at a time of so much religious strife. Pseudo-Dionysus, as many of you know, was its most eloquent spokesman, and I quote him. Why is it, however, that theologians sometimes refer to God as yearning, eros, and love, agape, and sometimes as the yearned for and the beloved? On the one hand, he causes, produces, and generates what is being referred to, and on the other hand, he is the thing itself. He's yearning on the move, simple, self-move, self-acting, pre-existent in the good, flowing out from the good unto all that is, and returning once again to the good. In his theology, Dionysus resolutely refuses to separate Eros from agape, desire from love. He writes, indeed, some of our writers on sacred matters have, matters have thought that the title yearning is more divine than love. So let us not fear this title of Eros, yearning, nor be upset by what anyone has to say about these two names. For in my opinion, the sacred writers regard yearning, Eros, and love, agape, as having one and the same meaning. Divine love is the source of human craving in his work. It is the author of our desire. For Dionysus, God even creates the world out of an explosion and overflowing of Eros. 
The very cause of the universe, he writes, is the beautiful, good, superabundance of his benign yearning for all, carried outside of himself in the loving care he has for everything. He is, as it were, beguiled by goodness, by love, and by yearning, and is enticed away from his transcendent dwelling place and comes to abide within all things. As all is created from divine eros, so all yearns for its divine source. We seek God to combine with God, who yearns for us. The logic is Eucharistic. Love is consummated in physical and spiritual union. The union of mortals grants access to the union with the immortal. He refuses uh, the concept of competition between a lowly carnal love and a higher spiritual love. Rather, he joins them to produce the fruit of human and religious love. Such an understanding of human love challenges us to rethink idolatry. When love of man or woman leads to God instead of away from God, it cannot be idolatrous. And so, to return to the Dean of St. Paul's, in his poetry, instead of finding passion dangerous, Dunn's speakers confront another threat, not passion, not love, but inauthentic worship, false valuation. Sonnet 18 ventures to describe what idolatry would be with more specificity. Following through the trope of the church as the bride of Christ, it suggests that perhaps embracing one church at the expense of loving God could be idolatrous. The bride of Christ, he writes, could be richly painted on the other shore. That would be Spain, the Church of Spain. Could be robbed and torn, lamenting and mourning in Germany and here, here meaning England, that is the Protestant church. Or she could be on Mount Moriah, the early church, or even on the seven hills of Rome. But then he writes, all of these are partial. The true bride of Christ knows no single place, but all places. The verse goes like this, betray kind husband, thy spouse, to our sights. Again, the, the bride of Christ uh, is the church. Betray kind husband, thy spouse, to our sights. And let mine amorous soul court thy mild dove, who is most true and pleasing to thee then when she is embraced and open to most men. At her best, he seems to say explicitly, the bride of Christ is promiscuous. He likes to be provocative. The bride of Christ pleases God most when she gives to most. Embracing Eros as divine takes the speaker to the logical conclusion, the more love, the better. Dangers do not lurk from love, but from its lack from not enough love, from false love, and above all, from no love. This is the devil for John Donne. The title of his lyric, The Community, alludes to a social group, holy communion, and common all at once. Again, the title's The Community. He writes, good we must love and must hate ill, for ill is ill and good, good still. But there are things indifferent which we may neither hate nor love, but one and then another prove, and we shall find our fancy bent. The speaker begins in this poem by defining women as adiaphora, that is, things indifferent, and therefore as available for use, and writes, but since she, that is nature, did them so create that we may neither love nor hate, only this rests, all, all may use. But for all of its playfulness, the poem becomes, in the final stanza, not only sexually, but also theologically charged. But they are ours, that is women, as fruits are ours. He that but tastes, he that devours, and he that leaves all doth as well. Changed loves are but changed sorts of meat, and when he hath the kernel eat, who doth not fling away the shell? Is the offensive implication that having had the favors of a woman, her colonel, the man should then fling her away? If so, this conforms to the stance of the speaker as a libertine. And there's a lot of debate about uh, the racy Jack Nunn versus the divine John Dunn, but of course, smarter critics understand this is the same man <laughs> writing these poems. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, however, the language of Colonel and Shell also permeated the discourse on the Eucharist, where the Colonel signaled the substance and the Shell the accidents. In that sense, the final couplet suggests, when you have the substance, why worry about the accidents? I'll read it again. When he hath the Colonel eat, who doth not fling away the Shell? When you have taken in the true Christ, why worry about the status of the bread and the wine? The title of the poem, Community, then means not only the community of the women and men who have one another sexually, it also alludes to the body of believers, the church community. And in this sense, changed loves are not only new women, but the change wrought by loving Christ. In the end, the theological argument helps to make sense of the sexual one. Asking, who needs the shell when he has the kernel, the speaker has suggested that he does not need all these women because he has all in his one true love, God. So there's nothing promiscuous after all in this poem, community. Meat, instead of the elements, bread and wine, is precisely the way that Herbert, George Herbert, refers to the body of Christ in his stunning, famous, Eucharistic lyric, Love. It's the final poem in the temple, his great compendium of uh, religious lyrics. Marked by its ease and the deceptive simplicity of presenting deep theological and emotional drama, Love is often thought of as Herbert's quintessential poem. It derives its rich texture from the echo of many biblical passages describing God inviting man to a feast. The Song of Songs 2-4, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. The 23rd Psalm where God is a gracious host. Matthew 26-29 and Luke 12-37, where the master comes and serves his servants. Revelations 3.20, the promised messianic banquet. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. And Matthew 22.1 through 10 and Luke 14.7-24, that is the parables of the Great Supper. Herbert's unworthy guest alludes most directly to Matthew's version of the parable. The king said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. But Herbert has changed the plot. Luke 14, 16 says, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many, and at the time for the banquet he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited, come for now it's ready. But they all alike began to make excuses, and the householder in anger said to the servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, bring in the poor and the maimed and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you've commanded has been done, and still there's room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges, compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of these men who are invited shall taste of my banquet. But Herbert, again, changes the plot. For in his version, love does not only invite a guest who refuses, making excuses, and is pronounced unworthy, and then replaced by someone else because the host gives up on them. In Herbert's version, love will not be refused. And you know the poem. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, said love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. The feast of love to which God has invited man alludes to both the earthly communion with the implied pun on host and the heavenly marriage banquet it anticipates. 
In the course of this conversation between the host and guest, the guest claims that he's not worthy. He tries to back away, but love is holding on to him, continuing to engage him in conversation. The guest agrees that love created him, but insists that he has marred that created image, alluding to the original sin he wants to leave in shame. And love admits that the image of God in man has been marred, shame has ensued, but love reminds him that she has borne the blame and thereby imputed righteousness to him. But like so much ritual, poetry performs this theology. This is not only a conversation about worthiness, Rather, in the course of the conversation, in the course of this poem, the guest becomes worthy. Worthy first by acknowledging his lack of worth, by his humility. Worthy next by listening when he is told that his unworthiness has been accounted for. And worthy because he then understands, finally, that he belongs at the meal. All of these change him and begin to qualify him for the communion, for the last line. So I did sit and eat. The conversation becomes a conversion and finally issues in communion. The drama of the poem focuses with exquisite intensity on the invitation and the question of its acceptance, certainly not on the menu, not on the bread and wine or its status. What is at the heart of Herbert's mystery of the Eucharist is that an utterance could ever be heard, that a call could ever be answered, an offer ever received, an invitation ever accepted, indeed a conversation ever take place. Clearly for Herbert, an important aspect of this sacramental mystery is the mystery of language, of signification itself. I've argued today that the English reform poets did not inaugurate modernity by turning away from the medieval mystery of transubstantiation, but by making it symbolic and then by making language its chief vehicle into other cultural formations, creating thereby a sacramental poetics. In that understanding of language, what is said and its relation to the referent, the sign to the signified, becomes less important than the very activity of saying. And here I'm indebted to Emmanuel Levinas's thinking. In this sacramental model, Language is not merely understood as the servant of ontology, of standing for a thing, the way the bread signifies the body in, in, in uh, the most um, symbolic understanding. Instead, language works in conversation as it works in Herbert's masterpiece, not to pass one thing from another, but rather to highlight the very activity of speaking and hearing, the very exchange the miracle that someone hears when we speak. What is heard may well be left indeterminate. Whatever it is, it is the only utterance we make while, it li while we live, that is, praise from the depths, like Jonah's citing a psalm from the belly of the whale, praise expressed as that my mysterious hypostasis of joy and pain. And here strains of mystical theology resurface in this understanding of language. Milton, Dunn, and Herbert infused the cosmos, lovers, and conversation with sacramentality. Following the English Reformed impulse toward the symbolic Eucharist, they broadened the ritual from bread and wine into other cultural expressions, including poetry. Are these expressions a kind of nostalgia for the old faith? Are these poets lamenting that in some sense the departure of the doctrine of transubstantiation risked the departure of the divine itself, of a once meaningful world now emptied. I don't think so, because they didn't lose the sacrament, after all. They only extended it. Something else is impelling this sense of longing in their work. The ritual that harbored the potential of reconciliation may not have come through for them in this war-torn period. And here, as I conclude, I would prefer to express their longing as driven by hope instead of loss. A life world, conversation, justice, love, the departure of these Eucharistic impulses would indeed be very much worth lamenting. And these poets offer the hope that we will continue to desire these and strive for them, however difficult that task may be. 
When we live in a world of conflicting identities, cultural, national, ethnic, religious, and gendered, each asserting their particularity against another, the result is often violent. Conversely, the opposite demand for a universal can be attended by another kind of violence, by the risks of totalitarianism or global imperialism, in any case, a violence that can crush particularity in its relentless drive toward universality. Another option, a third option, that we try to imagine is a particular that honors other particulars, one that opens out toward the conversation among differences without coercion. The Eucharist harbors such an example. This is not to pretend that it has not served as the occasion for terrible strife in history, nor that it has not been used to distinguish between those who are welcome and those who are not. But in its intent to create a community that coheres, not from blood or territorial boundaries, not from history or political allegiance, but through sharing divinity, it seeks to overcome the potential pain of difference and achieve a reconciliation of differences. The irony that this only led to further strife over the meaning and form of that very ritual is only a testimony to the stubbornness of human aggression and not the failure of the sacrament. I think this is why, even in a time of intense conflict over the ritual, early modern thinkers sought to embrace its central impulses, that of a life world instead of a dead universe, of conversation instead of conflict, justice instead of the triumph of evils, and love instead of utility. To broaden these from a church ritual into a more seemingly secular cultural achievement could be perhaps to save them for a future time. Then too, perhaps the sacramental poetics conferred to us by these writers could be far more than a description of literary arts, but a way of living in the world and a way of regarding one another. Let me conclude with the hope that the potential of reconciliation harbored by communion could still inspire and will still inspire ever new cultural forms in a world of community. Thank you. Absolutely. The, this tradition of sacramental poetics continues up through modernity, including Hopkins. Yeah. So, absolutely, yes. Yes. What was the contemporary reaction to the rather unorthodox provider of Milton II Lesterian Eucharist? The contemporary. <laughs> Uh, what was the contemporary reaction to Milton's unorthodox Eucharist and, and the, the woman, the na Eve, presiding naked? Oh, well, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know the contemporary re reaction. I, I don't know. What, it depends on how we're going to define contemporary because uh, in this poem, I'll go to the poem, what happens when Eve ministers naked uh, to the angel Raphael and Adam is that uh, Raphael, the, the narrator says, if ever then, then, and he repeats the term then, he's very anxious about it, if ever then, then did man have cause to experience lust, but the angel did not because this is paradise and there is no lust. So he was just really appreciating this moment of purity. But Milton, for the reader, calls to mind the specter of lust because we're fallen. So he has us reading the scene like voyeurs 
who look at the naked Eve ministering the sacrament and have a dirty thought, and the narrator corrects the dirty thought and says, aha, if you were in paradise, you wouldn't be having this dirty thought. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> well. Is there a question there? It, you're, you're handing me a topic, and the, uh, the topic as I hear it is, what's the relation between sacrifice, violence, and communion? And language. And language. Well, I'm actually writing a book about sacrifice now, and I can't pretend that I've sorted it out. I know that I'm uh, intrigued by, but troubled by Rene Girard's work on um, scapegoating, um, the, uh, his theory that communities only can cohere around uh, a sacrifice is really compelling. Um, and then he sees Christianity as resolving that. Um, I had an interesting conversation this week with another scholar about the story of the binding of Isaac. Um, and in that story where the angel tells Abraham to stay his hand, don't lay a hand on that child, and instead uh, substitute, um, substitutes the ram, the real question is how, what are we to understand? What is, what is the Bible saying about sacrifice there? Um, some people read it as proleptic of the sacrifice of, of Christ that can only be fulfilled then and, and um, truly fulfilled. Um, others read it as a polemic against sacrifice. In the old days, we would sacrifice, but we no longer do this. We no longer pledge our fealty to God and to one another in this way. Um, and, and I add to the, the sacrifice of Christ in my thinking, uh, the, the trial and death of Socrates, um, so that in my understanding of the Western tradition, we not only have uh, the binding of Isaac, but the sacrifice of Ishmael, who's cast out, uh, the passion of Christ and, and the death of Socrates as these foundational texts in Western culture that we, we really have to grapple with what it can be used anyway. This is what I say in The Curse of Cain. I mean, you know, you can use the, the violence in the scriptures a, against enemies to justify your own violence, but it can also be a holy violence that really insists that evil has to be defeated. How, how are these images of sacrifice being used is the question, and that's the real issue. Yeah. Yes.
<laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's the short answer. Uh, I, I find it incredibly tragic that religion should be a source of strife when, it should, when it's a resource for so much healing. Uh, when religion is our primary cultural resource for uh, concepts of charity and goodness and kindness, uh, to, to turn to religion to justify acts of aggression strikes me as especially tragic. So, uh, yes. I, I don't think that's necessarily a middle way, though. I, uh, you know, like picking... Uh, I think it's m more the transcendent move. That is going to the higher level of, of communing in the body of God, in the case of the Eucharist, without worrying about how, how you perform the ritual and wanting to exclude people either who can't be there at all, like myself, or people who don't do it in the way you want or don't give it the significance you want and, and, you know, and turn that into fencing off identities. I mean, there were blood, blood baths over the Eucharist in the early modern period, so, and that should be a lesson to us all. So the transcendent move is definitely the one I would make. very nervous about reading this here, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's so much a part of the Christian Precisely. rhetorical tradition. Precisely. It's been driven out in America. Out yeah. America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> When you said that. Well, yeah, really about uh, feeling danger. Mm -hmm. Or if one speaks about the use of the, uh, the kiss of the peace in the ancient church, mm -hmm. that this was a kiss on the lips. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 it's frightening. And you know that Bernard's long commentary on the Song of Songs dwells on the line, he kissed me with the kisses of my mouth. So it's a, it's a difficult one. That's my phone. You can ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, I forgot to turn it off, I'm sorry. Um, yes, okay, so um, what do I think about this? <laughs> I think you're... Well, I think that, it, that if sexuality is going to become illicit, uh, then the perfectibility of man becomes a real problem, theologically. That would be my short answer. 